18-year-old Tory Lang was found shot to death at Yellow River Park in Gwinnett County, Georgia, during the early morning hours in July of 2021. About a week later, her car was found abandoned, burned, and hidden in a nature preserve roughly five miles from where her body had been found. While most of Lang's friends said they had no idea why she would have been at the park at the time of her murder. Investigators eventually connected the crime to one of her best friends, Austin Ford, who was charged with the young woman's murder. Ford claimed that he was innocent and that Lang's death was not caused by foul play. The case went to trial twice and ended in a hung jury both times. Ford was ultimately convicted of concealing the death of another and two theft by taking charges, and prosecutors decided not to try him for a third time on the more serious charges charges including murder and aggravated assault. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison followed by 10 years of probation, and the exact circumstances leading up to Lang's death remain unclear. Number 19. Yasmin Martin After a night out bar hopping in Sunderland, England with friends in December of 2022, British teenager Yasmin Martin got behind the wheel of a car with her friends in the passenger seats. With nearly twice the legal amount of alcohol in her system, she drove at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour speed limit zone. Martin eventually lost control of the vehicle and struck a barrier, killing backseat passenger Mia Marsh. According to a witness, Martin was driving like she was invincible and got angry whenever someone asked her to slow down. She had also gone into a rage at the last bar the group stopped at when she crossed paths with an ex, and a worker had made a comment about how he hoped she wasn't driving. Martin, who had no prior criminal record, initially told police that someone had drugged her drink at a bar, but surveillance footage ruled this out as a possibility. She later admitted to a charge of causing death by dangerous driving and was spared from prison time, but was banned from driving. Her defense attorney said that she quit drinking after the accident and took full responsibility for her actions. And while Martin said that she wished she could turn back time, her remorseful words did little to comfort Marsh's devastated family. Number 18. Margesta Marty Thornton In September 2021, 30-year-old Reuben Rich Hensley of Columbus, Georgia, began to suspect his best friend, 37-year-old Margesta Marty Thornton, of sleeping with his wife, Jasmine Hall. It was true that Thornton and Hall had grown close while Hensley frequently worked out of town for a solar energy company, and when Hensley discovered the extent of this closeness, he drove from Atlanta to Columbus in a rage and began searching the city for the pier. He became increasingly angry when Hall failed to answer his repeated phone calls. At around 9.30 p.m., Thornton took a phone call from Hensley while exiting his parents' home. Unaware that his furious friend was outside waiting for him, Hensley shot him three times with a rifle, then sped off as Thornton's family members came outside and screamed in horror at the sight of their mortally wounded loved one. It quickly became apparent that there was nothing they could do to save him. Based on the angle of Thornton's bullet wounds, it was apparent that he had been ducking or crouching when he was shot. The incident was reportedly captured by a neighbor's surveillance camera, and two witnesses were able to identify the getaway car as a red Mustang. When Hall learned about the model of car the shooter had been driving, she knew it was no coincidence that her husband owned the same type and color of vehicle. She called Hensley and told him that witnesses had identified his car and that he was a suspect in the crime. A few hours later, Hensley's Mustang was found abandoned and on fire with a shell casing inside, matching the caliber of the murder weapon. It was only a matter of time before Hensley was captured and arrested on suspicion of murder. He pleaded not guilty and maintained his innocence throughout the remainder of his court proceedings. During his trial, Hall testified that she and Thornton were only close platonic friends and that they were never anything more, despite what her now ex-husband believed. In March of 2024, the jury found Hensley guilty of malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, first-degree arson, and using a gun to commit a crime resulting in a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Number 17. Vernon Stokes 
In late May of 2022, 20-year-old Vernon Stokes was found dead on a Materi, Louisiana street with at least 10 gunshot wounds. While searching his phone, police found a series of photos that showed his best friend. 22-year-old Brandon Thomas Clark posing in front of him with a gun. The pictures were taken at the crime scene just minutes before Stokes was shot, and it also appeared as though someone had rummaged through the young man's car before fleeing the scene. Several weeks later, U.S. Marshals apprehended Thomas Clark in Texas. He faces a second-degree murder charge in connection with Stokes' death. Vernon's mother, Nichelle Stokes, told NOLA.com that she was utterly shocked by the news. She said that Vernon and Thomas Clark grew up together and were like brothers, and that she treated the suspect like a son. Nichelle told police that the pair were out celebrating Thomas Clark's birthday when the fatal shooting happened. Thomas Clark has denied any involvement in the murder, claiming that he wasn't even there when it happened. But prosecutors believe that the photos found in Stokes' phone prove otherwise and are prepared to argue their case in court. It's unclear whether a trial date has been set. Number 16. Edmund Lamont Butler Teenager Edmund Lamont Butler of River Rogue, Michigan, was killed by his best friend, Zayar Brooks, in July of 2022. While responding to a call about the incident, police found Butler dead in the driver's seat of his car with a gunshot wound to the head. Brooks was taken into custody about a month later and was charged as an adult with first-degree premeditated murder, felony murder, carrying a concealed weapon, and two counts of felony firearm. According to police, he got into the back seat of Butler's car, fired a single shot into the back of the victim's head, and fled the scene. In June of 2023, Brooks pleaded guilty to a reduced second-degree murder charge and various weapon-related counts. He was sentenced to 23 to 40 years in prison. His reason for killing his best friend remains unclear to this day. Number 15. Jamie Goff On what began as a normal day in 2004, a middle schooler named Michael Hernandez stabbed his best friend, Jamie Goff, more than 40 times in a school bathroom. He then went to class as Goff lay dying from his injuries. It wasn't long before Goff's body was discovered and suspicion against Hernandez was quick to follow. The murder weapon was found inside his book bag and there was blood on his clothing, which only furthered investigators' belief that he had killed his friend. Hernandez claimed that a gang member had killed Goff while forcing him to restrain the victim, but there was no evidence to suggest that this was the case or that anyone other than Hernandez was involved, and he eventually confessed, leading to a first-degree murder charge against the teenager. When the case finally went to trial in 2008, roughly four years after the incident, Hernandez argued through his attorneys that he was insane at the time of the homicide. The prosecution claimed otherwise, citing a journal containing a hit list and other evidence to suggest that he was not insane and that Goff's murder was premeditated. In the diary, Hernandez had written about how he had always been fascinated with notorious serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. He stated that he was on a mission to cleanse the planet by killing and even mentioned the desire to murder his own sister. The jury rejected this argument, however, and found him guilty as charged, resulting in a life sentence without parole. He died in prison in 2021 at the age of 31. Number 14. James Knapp 59-year-old Patrick Griffin and 65-year-old retired school teacher James Knapp were best of friends of 20 years, but something went terribly wrong between them on a Saturday night. In May of 2022, when police responded to a 911 call at Griffin's residence in New Fairfield, Connecticut, and found Knapp suffering from a large stab wound to his stomach. The two men had gotten into an altercation after visiting a bar in Patterson, New York, leaving them both wounded. They were taken to the hospital where Knapp succumbed to his injuries and Griffin was subsequently charged with Knapp's murder. Knapp's son told investigators that his father had gone to watch the Kentucky Derby with Griffin on the night of his death. Griffin claimed that he had acted in self-defense after Knapp stomped on him and dragged him inside the house in a statement. Police said that intoxicating substances were thought to have played a role in the tragic incident. It was also revealed that Griffin had prior convictions, but none of them were recent. A jury found Griffin guilty of first-degree intentional manslaughter and first-degree reckless manslaughter following an eight 
day trial during the spring of 2023. In August of that year, he was sentenced to 16 years in prison, followed by five years of probation. During his sentence in hearing, Griffin apologized to Knapp's family for the pain his actions caused, but his words came as little comfort to the victim's loved ones who accused the convicted killer of only caring about himself while having no regard for the fate of his supposed best friend. Number 13. Avery Weathers while en route to the scene of a reported shooting one afternoon in May of 2022, deputies in Edie County, New Mexico, crossed paths with a pickup truck being driven by a 29-year-old oil field worker named Tevin Devonta O'Brien Morissette with another man in the passenger seat. In the back seat, they found Morissette's best friend and co-worker, 33-year-old Avery Kadeem Weathers suffering from a gunshot wound. The group was on their way to the hospital to get treatment for Weathers, who completed the rest of the journey in an ambulance. He died from his injuries, and Morissette was charged with his murder, in addition to being best friends and co-workers. Morissette and Weathers were roommates who lived near their work site south of Carlsbad. During police questioning, Morissette explained that he and Weathers had invited a co-worker over to their trailer to grill steaks, drink beer and whiskey and watch a basketball game. At some point during the gathering, he and Weathers began to argue over religion, leading to a physical altercation between the two. Morissette claimed that Weathers challenged him to a fight and attacked him, and that he had retrieved his gun from his vehicle and shot his friend in self-defense. But the co-worker told police a much different story, claiming that he broke up the fight and that Weathers was walking toward his trailer when Morissette got his gun. The co-worker also said that he pleaded with Morissette not to use the weapon, only to be told someone's gonna die tonight. The men's boss reportedly showed up at the scene after hearing the gunshot and helped load Weathers into Morissette's pickup truck. In the meantime, Morissette dialed 911 and reported the incident. He was charged with second-degree murder and in December 2023, his trial ended in a hung jury. It's unclear whether prosecutors plan to try Morissette again, but he does not appear to be in custody at this time. Number 12. Aaron Davis The friendship between Brandon Christopher Reisner and Brigham Young University alum Aaron Williams Davis dated back to middle school and they remained close even after graduating from college, but something went terribly wrong between them in November of 2022 when 21-year-old Davis stopped to visit Reisner in Rome, Georgia. While on his way to see his girlfriend, the two young men went out to a bar where they reportedly drank heavily, despite Davis not being much of a drinker. After returning to Reisner's home, Davis went to sleep in a spare bedroom. A short while later, Reisner entered the room and stabbed Davis at least 40 times, plunging the knife into his friend's body was such frenzy that he got blood spatter on the ceiling. He then dragged Davis into the bathroom and attempted to dismember his body, but he only got as far as disemboweling the remains. A search of Reisner's phone and other evidence would later reveal that he conducted various internet searches for things like sheets, blankets, stain remover, and other supplies that one might use to clean up a murder scene. He also watched horror movies and went to Walmart where he bought tape and sheets that he used to wrap Davis's body with. Reisner then went to an urgent care clinic and got treatment for some cuts to his fingers. After that, he crammed Davis's body into a suitcase, placed the suitcase into the trunk of the victim's Toyota Prius, and buried his friend's body in a shallow grave nearby. He abandoned the Prius and went on the run, but surrendered following the discovery of Davis's remains. In June of 2024, Reisner pleaded guilty to malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, concealing the death of another, abandonment of a dead body, and theft by taking, as well as a misdemeanor charge of removing body parts from the scene of a death. He was sentenced to life without parole and his reasons for killing Davis remain a mystery to this day. Number 11. Colasia Mo. Mother of four Colasia Mo and her best friend Tyne Coots grew up together and eventually became roommates. Their friendship tragically ended in October of 2021 when the two women got into a disagreement about a man at their Jeffersonville, Indiana apartment after returning home from a gambling boat. During the argument, Coots stabbed Mo in the chest while the victim's teenage sister helplessly looked on. Realizing the situation had gotten out of hand, she rendered first aid to her friend until emergency responders arrived. At first, Coots told responding officers that Mo had stabbed herself. She then changed her story and admitted that she had been holding the knife while claiming that Mo 
ran into it. After that, Ku said that she had accidentally stabbed her best friend. When she learned that Mo had succumbed to her injuries, she lost all self-control and had to be physically restrained. Authorities charged Ku's with murder and resisting law enforcement. In December of 2021, roughly two months after the tragedy, she pleaded guilty to felony reckless homicide. In exchange for the remainder of the charges being dropped, she was sentenced to five years in prison, just one year short of the maximum six-year term. It wasn't a harsh enough punishment in the opinion of Mo's loved ones, but their main focus moving forward was to ensure that her kids are loved and provided for. Number 10. Tana Farrell 18-year-old Tana Farrell of Omaha, Nebraska was killed in March of 2022 by his best friend, 18-year-old Blake Miller, who accidentally shot him while playing with a gun. According to police, the two friends and another young man were drinking and messing around on a Saturday when the tragedy occurred. Believing that his pump-action shotgun was unloaded, Miller pointed it at Farrell and pulled the trigger, unintentionally striking the victim in the chest with a bullet. Miller reportedly admitted that he did not check to ensure that the gun was unloaded before firing it. Prosecutors acknowledged that there appeared to be a lack of intent, especially based on how distraught Miller was over Farrell's death, but they nevertheless believed that he had broken the law and charged him with manslaughter. The judge overseeing the case released Miller on his own recognizance as the case proceeded in court in December of 2022, roughly nine months after the incident. Miller pleaded no contest to the charge. He was sentenced to 48 months of probation. During his sentence in hearing, Miller apologized for his actions and the pain they caused to Farrell's loved ones. In an unusual twist, the punishment fell in line with the wishes of Farrell's family who told the judge that they loved Miller as one of their own and asked for the young man to be spared from prison time. In fact, Miller's relationship with the Farrell family continued in light of the circumstances and they remained close after his best friend's death. Number 9. Bruce Swierk in September of 2021, 50-year-old Gregory Thayer got upset at his best friend, 48-year-old Bruce Swierk, for some remarks he was making. Unwilling to tolerate Swierk's talking trash and effed up comments, Thayer went to the bedroom of his Ulster, New York home, retrieved a gun and shot Swierk in the back of the head while he sat at the kitchen table. At the time of the shooting, Swierk was visiting the area from California. Instead of immediately dialing 911, Thayer called his sister removed the rest of the bullets from the gun and took photos of his gravely wounded friend. Later that month, a grand jury indicted him on a murder charge. Thayer opted for a bench trial, leaving his fate in the hands of the judge overseeing his case. The judge determined that Thayer had experienced an extreme emotional disturbance at the time of the crime and found him guilty of a reduced manslaughter charge along with a weapon-related count. He sentenced Thayer to concurrent prison sentences of 25 and 15 years, followed by five years of probation. After uncovering evidence that his trial was unfair, Thayer appealed his case. In October of 2024, the New York State Supreme Court ruled in agreement with his claims and granted him a new trial. The outcome of the case remains to be seen. Number 8. Eric Plunkett Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. is one of the world's top colleges for the deaf and hard of hearing. In addition to offering a top quality learning environment, it fosters a close sense of community and has an impressive safety record, which perhaps explains why people were shocked when 18-year-old freshman Eric Plunkett was bludgeoned to death in his dorm room just weeks into the fall 2000 semester, with nobody around who was capable of hearing his screams for help, he had been choked and beaten with a chair. Plunkett's body was found by his best friend, Joseph Messer Jr., who lived in the dorm room across the hall. While investigators questioned Messer, they were more suspicious of another student, Thomas Minch, who Plunkett was rumored to have a romantic interest in. Minch had rejected Plunkett's advances but considered him a friend and denied any involvement in his murder. He was even able to provide a verifiable alibi, yet remained a person of interest in the case. Left with no other choice, law enforcement allowed Minch to walk free due to a lack of evidence. In the meantime, he was banned from Gallaudet's campus. He continued to maintain his innocence, but the authorities didn't believe him until four months later, when another student, 19-year-old Benjamin Varner, was stabbed to death in 
his dorm room. Minch was easily able to prove that he was at his home in New Hampshire, but investigators suspected that the same person was responsible for both Plunkett and Varner's murders. Based on this theory, they were finally forced to focus on other suspects. There were several commonalities between the two murders. Both victims had been robbed, and the trail of financial activity that followed led straight to Joseph Messer Jr., the so-called best friend who had discovered Plunkett's body. During questioning, Messer confessed to killing both Plunkett and Varna, and admitted that he was motivated by a desire for money. He told a much different story at trial, claiming that he had seen visions of the professional wrestler, The Undertaker, who had encouraged him to commit the crimes. Mental health experts testify that Messer suffered from depression and antisocial behavior stemming from his upbringing in Guam, where he struggled to communicate his feelings and thoughts to his family due to his deafness. The jury was unswayed by these claims, or at least didn't see Messer's struggles as an excuse to murder people. He was found guilty as charged and is currently serving two life sentences without parole. Number 7. Roger Lee Butch Pratt Acting on an informant's tip in 1989, police in Greenville, Pennsylvania, found the shallow grave of Roger Lee Butch Pratt, who had vanished from the area shortly after his graduation from Thiel College the year before. He had been brutally beaten to death while handcuffed and bound at the ankles with a necktie. During his four years at Thiel, Pratt had roomed with his best friend and fraternity brother, Edward Ed Swigger, who was now the prime suspect in his murder. The informant who had provided police with the location of Pratt's remains was Swigger's ex-girlfriend, Linda Carlin, and she had admitted to being present when Ed and his brother, Michael, buried the body. Investigators also learned that shortly after Pratt and Swigger graduated in 1988, Ed had called his brother, Michael, in a panic. He told Michael that he and Pratt had stolen some stereo equipment from their fraternity brothers, and Pratt had gotten caught. And although Pratt never implicated Swigger in the crime, the two had recently had a falling out, causing Swigger to fear that this was now a possibility. Moreover, Pratt reportedly knew about other shady activities that Swigger had been involved in, including an arson he had committed for insurance money, and Swigger was desperate not to get into any legal trouble because a criminal record would undoubtedly ruin his ambitions to become a lawyer. Ed persuaded his brother Michael to help him confront Pratt and bribe him to keep his mouth shut, or at least that's what Michael believed they were going to do. Meanwhile, Ed convinced Teresa Wakolchik and Caroline Lully to persuade Pratt to travel to Akron, Ohio for a party. The women picked Pratt up at a bus stop and drove him to a remote location where Ed and Michael were lying in wait following the discovery of Pratt's body. Michael Swigger denied participating in the murder, which he blamed entirely on Ed, while admitting that he had helped transport and bury Pratt's body. They were both charged with murder while Linda Carlin was accused of helping to mastermind the crime. During Ed's trial in 1990, he claimed that Pratt's death was a tragic accident resulting from the assault going too far. He insisted that Pratt was like a brother to him but was nevertheless convicted of murder and sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. He'll become eligible for parole in 2029. Michael Swigger was also convicted of killing Pratt along with arson. He was sentenced to 21 to 53 years in prison and was paroled in the early 2000s. Linda Carlin was convicted of conspiracy to kidnap and was sentenced to 7 to 15 years in prison while Teresa Wakulchik and Caroline Lully pleaded guilty to the same charge and were sentenced to probation. Number 6. Elijah Bradley 24-year-old engineer Elijah Bradley was reported missing in Gilbert, Arizona in August of 2024 after failing to show up at work. He had also fallen out of touch with his mother, which his family said was unlike him. Four days after Bradley was announced as missing, members of law enforcement found his dismembered remains in the desert near the town of Gila Bend, roughly an hour's drive from Gilbert. Following several more weeks of investigation, Prosecutors charged Bradley's close childhood friend, 23-year-old Samuel Bush, with second-degree intentional murder and concealing a body. Bush reportedly denied any involvement in Bradley's death, but admitted that the victim had visited his apartment several days before he was reported missing. Inside the suspect's vehicle, police found receipts for the purchase of a saw and saw blades. 
items they believe he used to cut up Bradley's body, as well as a gun under the driver's seat. During the search of Bush's apartment, law enforcement found an electric saw with Bradley's blood on it. Investigators also connected Bush to the crime through cell phone location data, which placed him in the area where Bradley's remains were discovered. According to the most recent available updates on the case, Bush remains in custody with bail set at $1.5 million. Authorities have yet to reveal an alleged motive for the murder. Number 5. Robert Barroso Toward the end of their friendship, 29-year-old Stephen Getter and his best friend, 28-year-old Robert Barroso, fell in love with the same woman. The rivalry lasted for several years, at one point sparking a heated disagreement over which one of them had fathered the woman's child. Their dispute ended tragically in December of 2016, when the men agreed to settle the score over a fist fight. According to sources close to the families, this final face-off stemmed from Getter's belief that Barroso had fathered the child of their shared love interest. It would later be revealed that Barroso was not the child's father. Barroso never returned from the planned brawl and was found murdered several days later. He had been shot several times and stabbed in the neck and face. Getter was charged with murder and fought the case while maintaining his innocence. In August of 2017, a jury found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the initial aftermath of Barroso's murder, his loved ones had a hard time believing that Getter was capable of such a violent act. His mother, Lori Gothier, told the Detroit Free Press that it was hard to see Getter acting emotionless in court, especially considering how the men used to be like family to one another. Following Getter's sentencing, she said that she hopes he has a hard, brutal life in prison and that he is forced to think about the lives he destroyed on a daily basis. Number 4. Christian Aguilar 18-year-old Christian Aguilar vanished seemingly into thin air in September of 2012 during his freshman year at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He was reported missing by his girlfriend, Erica Fryman, and his best friend, Pedro Bravo, the latter of whom was the last known person to see him alive. Bravo initially told police that he and Aguilar had picked up a hitchhiker the previous evening during their drive home from a local Best Buy electronics store. He described the hitchhiker as a grey-haired man in his 50s or 60s. After dropping the man off at his destination, the two friends supposedly got into an argument over how Aguilar was handling some problems in his personal life. Aguilar asked to be let out of the car and Bravo claimed that this was the last he saw of his friend. Further investigation revealed that Bravo had previously dated Aguilar's girlfriend, Erica Fryman. In fact, Fryman had broken up with him shortly before she started dating Aguilar, leading to lingering tensions between the two young men. It certainly piqued the interest of detectives who saw the romantic rivalry as a possible motive for murder. About three weeks after Aguilar disappeared, his heavily decomposed remains were found in a wooded area. Further investigation revealed that Bravo had drugged Aguilar's Gatorade with sedatives and probably strangled him to death. Bravo was charged with murder but continued to deny any involvement in the crime, even in the face of growing evidence pointing toward his guilt including a jailhouse informant's testimony that he had confessed to killing Aguilar. A jury found him guilty of seven charges, including first-degree murder, kidnapping, false imprisonment, poisoning, improper transportation of human remains, giving false information to law enforcement in a missing person case, tampering with evidence and providing false reports. Bravo was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, but continues to insist that he is not responsible for Aguilar's death. Number 3. Morgan Connors Late one afternoon in November of 2022, police responded to a report of a possible homicide at a trailer park in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. A young transgender woman named Ash Cooper, formerly known as Joshua Cooper, had contacted a friend on Instagram and said that she had accidentally killed someone. During a video chat with the witness, Cooper flipped the camera around to show the victim's legs and feet, which appeared to be covered in blood. She asked the witness for help cleaning up the mess and disposing of the body, which belonged to her best friend, Morgan Connors. Instead of helping, the witness contacted law enforcement. Upon arriving at the scene, officers saw Cooper running from the trailer. Inside, they found Connors' lifeless body on the bathroom floor. She had died from a gunshot wound and her killer had tried to clean up the crime scene. 
Police captured Cooper near the crime scene later that day and booked her into custody on suspicion of murder. She reportedly claimed that she got the gun out of her father's safe while replacing its dead batteries, which had rendered the lock inoperable. In March of 2024, Cooper pleaded guilty to third-degree murder, possession of an instrument of crime and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. She was sentenced to 15 to 40 years in state prison, followed by seven years of probation. The judge ordered her to comply with all the rules and regulations of her probation once that day comes and to undergo psychiatric and psychological evaluations. Today's topic was requested by Or07 and Stitch 3935. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number two, Heidi Broussard. 33-year-old mother-to-be Heidi Broussard was thrilled to learn that her best friend, Magan Fiera Muska, was also pregnant. The peers shared their excitement about raising children of the same age together, and they even wondered if they would give birth on the same day, but Fiera Muska wasn't actually pregnant. And in November 2019, Broussard and her weeks-old baby vanished from their home in Austin, Texas. Eight days later, police found Broussard's murdered remains inside a duffel bag in a car that was parked outside Fiera Muska's Houston area home. When officers showed Fiera Muska's boyfriend, Christopher Green, a photo of Broussard's baby, he reportedly admitted that the child resembled a baby inside their residence. In fact, he reportedly encouraged Texas Rangers to enter the home once he learned that the baby might be a kidnapping victim. Furthermore, Green said that Fiera Muska was not pregnant to his knowledge and that their relationship had been rocky as of recent. Armed with probable cause, law enforcement made entry into the residence and found the child unharmed. By all appearances, it seemed as though Fiera Muska had faked an entire pregnancy in front of certain people with plans to steal Broussard's baby, indicating that the murder and subsequent abduction were planned out well ahead of time. Fiera Muska was charged with capital murder and kidnapping. She pleaded guilty in 2023 after an initially planning to fight the case and was sentenced to 55 years in prison. If best friends turning on one another wasn't enough betrayal for you for a day, then find out how sour relationships can turn in our previous release of When Criminal Couples Go Wrong, coming up right after number one. Stay tuned. Number one, Dylan Miller Matome. In what police described as a mishandling of a firearm, 27-year-old Dylan Douglas Miller Matone was fatally shot by his best friend, Anthony Sanchez, in March of 2024. Police were summoned to the scene in West Jordan, Utah, by Sanchez, who called 911 and stated that he had shot his friend. He told police that he didn't think the gun was loaded when he pointed it at Miller Matone's chest, at which point the weapon had accidentally discharged. Miller Matone was reportedly alive when emergency responders arrived but immediately succumbed to his injuries. Meanwhile, Sanchez was left in disbelief saying, I can't believe I shot my best friend. Police later revealed that there was drug paraphernalia in plain sight when they arrived at the residence and they mentioned that they believed the incident had been captured on cell phone video. And while Sanchez said that he was just trying to be funny, and seemed genuinely distraught by the tragic effects of his actions, his remorse and lack of intent did not get him off the hook from legal consequences. He was charged with negligent homicide and being a restricted person in possession of a firearm, but does not appear to be in custody at this time. Number 7. Jason Andrews and Amanda Logue In May of 2010, tattoo shop owner Dennis Abrahamson was found dead at his home in Newport Ritchie, Florida, in the aftermath of a party gone horribly wrong. The 41-year-old's body was discovered face down on a massage table after he'd been stabbed and bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer. Abrahamson had paid escort an adult film actress, Amanda Logue, then in her late twenties to perform at his private event. Logue, known in the adult industry as Sunny Day, was alone in the house with Abrahamson after all the other attendees had left at around 5 a.m. on May the 15th. Throughout the party, Logue had been texting with her boyfriend, Jason Andrews, who waited outside in a car. The pair had become inseparable after meeting on the set of an adult film in 2009, even though at the time Logue was still married to a man in Georgia. The dozens of messages that she and Andrews exchanged on the night revealed that they'd planned to rob and kill Abrahamson. Once the man was bludgeoned to death, the couple made off with $6,000 in cash, his credit cards and a video camera. They were subsequently arrested and two months later indicted on first-degree murder charges. 
Logue told detectives she'd had nothing to do with the actual murder and that after bashing Abrahamson's head in, Andrews had physically forced her to look at his crushed skull, threatening to do the same to her if she ever told anyone. Under a plea deal, she admitted second-degree murder in 2012 and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Andrews had earlier pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was given life without parole. Number 6. Tyler Terry and Adrienne Simpson In May of 2021, a South Carolina couple dubbed the modern-day Bonnie and Clyde went on a two-week crime spree, spanning over a thousand miles in multiple states. 26-year-old Tyler Terry and his girlfriend, Adrienne Simpson, had begun dating while the latter was still married to her estranged husband, Eugene. Simpson and Terry's rampage began on May the 2nd, when they gunned down Eugene in Chester. The woman was reportedly armed with a nickel-plated 38 Smith & Wesson revolver, while Terry carried a 9mm pistol. They fatally shot Eugene and then dumped his body on Stroud Road before claiming their next victim, 35-year-old transgender woman Thomas Harding in York. The latter, identified as Terry's former partner, was found motionless on the floor between a couch and a door when law enforcement performed a welfare check at her home. Terry then shot up a 2007 Maserati at a Chester Taco Bell, leaving one man with life-threatening injuries before he and Simpson violently burglarized a home in Chester, again causing life-threatening injuries to their victim. More ruthless violence followed roughly two weeks later. After the couple had reached Missouri, Terry fired 10 times at a yellow Corvette on Highway 170, striking the car three times, but the driver escaped unharmed. Less than an hour later, Terry opened fire on a BMW carrying married couple, Stanley and Barbara Goodkin, both in their 70s. The woman was fatally shot in the head while Stanley survived after a bullet that hit his chest was stopped by his cell phone. The couple's fourth and final fatal victim was 58-year-old Dr. Sergei Zakarev, who was shot to death by Terry and robbed of his belongings in a hotel parking lot. On May the 17th, a chase with law enforcement ensued when the couple was found at a Bojangles in Richburg, South Carolina. Simpson, who'd been the driver throughout most of the spree, sped away from the police while Terry opened fire at them. 34-year-old Simpson eventually crashed and she was taken into custody, but her boyfriend had managed to flee into nearby woods. Simpson was often physically abused by Terry, and her booking photo showed her with a black eye, likely from a recent beating. She cooperated with law enforcement while a massive search involving drones and helicopters was launched for Terry, labeled an extremely dangerous fugitive and described by the Chester County Sheriff as the most violent man he'd ever heard of. Terry eluded capture for about a week before he was spotted by federal agents as he was hiding in vegetation, photos of his capture showing him covered in dirt while wearing a ripped shirt were shared online in the aftermath. He faced a plethora of charges including four murders while Simpson was charged as an accessory. Number 5. Chris Latham and Wendy Moore in the spring of 2013, South Carolina woman Nancy Latham was going through a divorce after 24 years of marriage to her husband and Bank of America executive Christopher, then in his late 40s. The reasons she'd cited for the separation had been the man's multiple affairs. They'd included one to 37-year-old former exotic dancer Wendy Moore, Christopher's living girlfriend, who worked as his secretary at the bank. On April the 5th of 2013, small-time criminal Aaron Wilkinson was pulled over in Charleston for a traffic violation and because law enforcement discovered a gun in his vehicle, he was taken in for further questioning. Wilkinson revealed that he'd received a hit packet for Nancy from a man named Samuel Yenawine. It contained photos of the woman and further information on her routine and habitual whereabouts. Wilkinson agreed to a monitored phone call which confirmed his reports. Yenna Wine was Moore's ex-husband and the ensuing investigation revealed that Christopher and his mistress had contracted him and Wilkinson to kill Nancy. Eliminating the woman would have kept her from testifying about their affair, which was against Bank of America's policy, as well as spare Christopher a fortune in divorce and alimony costs. The hitmen were given a $5,000 down payment and promised an additional $20,000 upon the job's completion. They were reportedly instructed to shoot 
anyone who got in their way, even if it meant killing Nancy's children. Fortunately, the murder plot fully unraveled following Wilkinson's arrest, and all four conspirators were arrested. Yellowwine took his own life in June of 2013 while awaiting trial, and Wilkinson was only sentenced to four years because he'd cooperated with the authorities. Moore was given the longest sentence, as she'd been named as the main facilitator in the plot. She was ordered to spend 15 years in federal prison after being found guilty of solicitation of murder for hire, possession of a firearm in the furtherance of a crime of violence, conspiracy and use of interstate facilities in the commission of murder for hire. Christopher was only found guilty of the latter and sentenced to 10 years. Both have since been released from custody. Number 4. Regis Derry Kindred and Kaylee Von Foster 21-year-old student Alex Oyombe Graydon, who was born in Kenya and adopted as a baby by an American family, was gunned down on May the 4th of 2019. Investigators working the case were quick to point out that Graydon had done absolutely nothing wrong. He had just left Taylor's Bar and Grill near the University of Oregon and was misidentified by Portland couple Regis Derry Kindred and Kaylee Von Foster, aged 30 and 29 respectively. The married couple with the woman behind the wheel had been tailing a vehicle they thought belonged to a rival gangster before targeting Graydon, a Lane Community College student with no criminal affiliations. He was pronounced dead at the scene while Kindred and Von Foster were charged with his murder four months later. The latter pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the second degree and was sentenced to six years in prison while Kindred, the gunman, admitted second-degree murder and was given life with parole available after 25 years. Number 3. Jeremy Jones and Christine Garner Shortly after 9 p.m. on March the 15th of 2022, Justin Peoples pulled up to a gas station in Tracy, California. While at the station, the Navy veteran and the father of two was reportedly involved in an unspecified altercation with a couple that the authorities would later describe as white supremacists. Jeremy Jones and Christine Garner, both in their 40s, launched a vicious attack on Peoples. Jones was reported to have repeatedly stabbed the man while his partner shot him. They then fled the scene and Peoples, who'd been left in critical condition after the attack, passed away in a local hospital a few hours later. Jones and Garner were arrested the following day and prosecutors found enough evidence to suggest that the killing of Peoples had been racially motivated. The couple reportedly had ties to the Aryan Brotherhood and skinhead extremist groups, the ideology of which was reinforced by Jones's tattoos, which included the words white and pride on opposite sides of his bicep. A third suspect, 58-year-old Christopher Demenko, was arrested as an accessory for allegedly helping the couple flee and dispose of evidence. The trio's case was ongoing as of the latest updates, but given their charges, they all faced lengthy prison sentences. Number 2. Emmanuel and Cara Lee Williams Between December of 2012 and November of 2013, a married Tampa couple carried out 15 bank robberies throughout Florida and Alabama. Emmanuel and Cara Lee Williams had reportedly done so to finance their gambling habits, pay bills, and take care of their newborn child. The couple's modus operandi involved Cara acting as the getaway driver and preparing bank teller notes for her husband. He then walked into the federally insured financial institutions while wearing a disguise. He passed the teller a note which implied he was armed and then made off with the cash. For one of the robberies, the roles were reversed with Cara walking into the bank and Emmanuel driving them away from the scene. An investigation conducted by the FBI and at least nine other local law enforcement offices and departments led to the couple's arrest on November the 7th of 2013. Emmanuel and Cara, both 29, were sentenced in May of the following year after they'd each pled guilty to conspiracy to obstruct, delay, or affect commerce by robbery. Cara was ordered to spend five years in federal prison, while her husband was given the same sentence with an added 10 months. Number 1. Jack Doherty and Shailen Moran on New Year's Day 2020, Rhode Island woman Cheryl Smith was fatally shot multiple times in the chest at her Portucket home. The previous day, 18-year-old Shailen Moran, also of Portucket, was visited by her boyfriend, Jack Doherty. 
from Albany, New York. The pair had reportedly never met in person before and for several weeks had maintained an online relationship. During 25-year-old Doherty's visit, they rented a room at a Hampton Inn and later in the day the man proposed to the teenager at a New Year's Eve party. Moran, who sported the tattoo of a target on her cheek, had already convinced Doherty to kill for her and they started planning the murder upon returning to their hotel. As it would eventually emerge in the fall of 2019, the teenager had briefly dated Smith's son, Leonard Troufield, but they'd broken up amidst mutual allegations of assault. As instructed by Moran, Doherty went to the home where the mother and son lived together and was reportedly ready to shoot anyone who opened the door. He was armed with a 3D printed handgun, which he'd showcased on his social media. Smith answered and was gunned down. Afterwards, Doherty ordered a lift and texted his fiance to confirm the kill, writing, now this is for life. Moran replied, I'm yours forever and you're mine. The couple were tracked down by law enforcement within a few hours and arrested as they were leaving their hotel room. Doherty was in possession of the murder weapon at the time. His trial was ongoing as of the latest updates on the case, but Moran was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years. After pleading guilty to first-degree murder, carrying a pistol without a license and conspiracy to commit murder. Thanks for watching. If you gave one of your friends a scratch-off ticket and they won 20 million dollars and they didn't give you any piece of the money, would you continue to be friends with them? Let us know in the comments section below.